Bible Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Our speaker today is Dr. Ron Rhodes. And before his salvation, he was a professional musician, had appearances on many television shows, including The Tonight Show, and for some of you can remember American Bandstand. He actually was uh, challenged to come to Christ by Shirley Boone backstage before each of them were on two different programs. Following his conversion to Christ, he left the music business, finished college, then came and earned both a THM and a THD here at Dallas Seminary. His specialty today is cult apologetics. He's authored more than 45 books, and from 1988 to 1995, he co-hosted the national radio broadcast, The Bible Answer Man. Since 1996, he has been president of Reasoning from the Scriptures Ministry that's located in Frisco, Texas. He's been married to his wife, Carrie, for 26 years, and they have two children, one in college and one preparing to start college. He is in the middle of it, in the thick of it, in uh, dialoguing, reasoning, arguing with at times, presenting the gospel in the world of those caught up in the cults. And he's here this morning to help us be prepared to do the same. We also will be using him as an adjunct faculty member uh, this next year to teach a course uh, of the same nature. So would you join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Ron Rhodes to our platform. Thank you. Well, good morning. You know, I have uh, got kind of a unique ministry. It's kind of a wild and a wacky ministry to the world of the cults, but I need to tell you that I love Jehovah's Witnesses, and I love Mormons, and I love New Agers, and Moonies, and members of the Baha'i faith, and all of those folks, and I hang out with those folks. And uh, since I left here in uh, 1986, we've been blessed to see many come out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. And we're talking thousands of people. And so praise the Lord for the grace that he has shown upon the kingdom of darkness. And so I'm very excited to be here. This is a subject that is near and dear to my own heart. And what I want to do to you today is just briefly give you seven keys to conversing with cultists. Nothing profound about it. You know, sometimes the strength is in the basics, in the essentials. And, you know, you're getting your theology and your Bible exposition here. But what I'm going to share with you now will actually help you communicate your theology, and your Bible exposition to cultists. I would like to begin by talking about Joseph Gutierrez. This is an individual that uh, I read about while I was in Philadelphia, and he's a steel mill worker. And he talks about how there's this one part of the building that has machinery that is several stories tall. And he talked about how when that machinery was on, the entire building would shake. And from the roof, there would be this fine, beautiful gray dust that would fall from the ceiling all the way to the ground. You have to understand also that there were bright lights shining inward in this giant room. So that light actually hit the gray dust as it was coming down. And it was a beautiful sight, kind of like snowflakes, if you're outside during the wintertime at nighttime. It's only recently that they've discovered that those beautiful gray flecks is actually asbestos. And Joseph Gutierrez cannot walk more than two or three feet without becoming winded because of the lung cancer that he now suffers through. You see, what was beautiful and enticing and wonderful turned out to be deadly. And this is exactly what you see in the kingdom of the cults. You see, the cults often portray themselves as having the answers for your lives. Whatever problem you have, They've got the solution. But what turns out to be appearing good actually ends up being deadly in the end. Now, my friends, here's something that motivates me. You've got a counterfeit Jesus who preaches a counterfeit gospel. You have got yourself a counterfeit salvation. There are no exceptions to that. That's what puts wind in my sails to minister to Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and New Agers. Yes, I read all their books. I read all the books that Jehovah's Witnesses put out and all the Mormons put out. I read lots of New Age books. In fact, right now I'm reading the books that Oprah just recommended. She's always uh, recommending New Age books. Now, I know that some of you are worried about me. You're saying, boy, that guy fills his mind with all kinds of trash, right? (laughs) Well, my wife, Carrie, Bill, you know her. 
Carrie makes me read two Christian books for every weird book. <laughs> See? Man, I read a lot. Whew. It's a lot of reading. But anyway, we need a strategy for talking to cultists. And what I'm going to do today is give you a strategy, just like you use a strategy for winning a chess game. And it's going to be seven basic fundamental points, and I've got 20 minutes, so I'm going to be quick. Now, don't neglect people skills. This is key number one. Don't neglect people skills. And I chose that photograph purposefully because this is a way a lot of people come across on the doorstep. You know, they've got this look on their face that says, I resent you being here. I don't like who you represent. I don't like your theology. The game is about to start on TV. And frankly, you're wasting your time. It's that kind of a look on the face. And also the body language is is kind of like this, you know, like this. And what you've got to do is open up and be friendly. Have a nice countenance on your face and let people see that you're friendly. You're going to want them to feel free to come back because that way you can have, you know, more than one chance to speak with them. And I promise you that if you've got to look like this on your face, you've lost the battle right then and there. Now, there's a key verse that's really revolutionized our ministry, and it's from 1 Peter 3.15. Allow me to read it to you. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Now, folks, I've been involved in apologetics for over 30 years now, out on the field, working with other apologists, And I know most of the apologists on a first-name basis, including the ones that you see on television, the one you hear on the radio. The fact is, is that almost all apologetics ministries focus on strong answers from the Bible. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Cult apologetics does involve strong answers from the Bible. But I'm convinced, based upon this verse and many others like it, that the biblical apologist begins with the person who is totally committed to Jesus Christ. That's where it has to start. You see, if you just have strong answers coming from an arrogant, prideful person, those answers mean nothing. They mean nothing. And in fact, that's the way most apologetics against the cults is done today. No wonder they have so few conversions. But I can tell you this, that if you have a person who is sold out to Jesus Christ, fully committed, so that it shows in the way that he lives... There's something different about that person. And that's the kind of person that shows respect and reverence and kindness to other people. Strong answers from that person mean everything. So you've got to begin here. If you want to be a biblical apologist, first you give your life to Jesus Christ and let him control everything. And then you give those strong answers. And I can guarantee you, you will see some fruit among Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and others. A second key is this. Don't assume that all members of a cult believe exactly the same thing. Now, let me tell you what most Christians do. They read a book on the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, and then when the doorbell rings, the uh, Christian opens the door and says to the Mormon, oh, well, you're that group that believes you can become a god. And typically, the Mormon responds by saying, well, I don't believe that. Can I tell you what we really believe? You don't want to tell a cultist what they believe. Typically, different cultists have different levels of understanding of their own doctrine. Let me tell you why that is. In the case of Mormons, some Mormons have access to the temple, others do not. The reason for that is that some Mormons have proven themselves so worthy to the local bishop that they're given like a little pass. It looks like a little uh, driver's license. And that gets them into the temple, and in the temple they learn new things that other Mormons are not privy to learn. And then still other Mormons listen to the Mormon president. You see, the Mormon president is the living prophet of the church. Other Mormons ignore the president. The point that I'm building up to is that different Mormons have different levels of understanding of Mormon doctrine. Because of that, you don't want to tell a Mormon what he believes. Here's what I suggest. If you're talking to a Mormon, you can say, do you believe that you're going to become a god one day, ruling your own planet? If he says yes, then you can assume he's a traditional Mormon, and then you can address him from the scriptures at that point. If he says no, though, here's what you say. I'm glad you don't believe that, but if I could prove to you that your church has traditionally taught this throughout its history, 
Would it make any difference to you? And then you can talk to them from the Bible. But either way, don't assume that all members of a cult believe exactly the same thing because they simply do not. Number three, key number three, always define your terms. Now, isn't that a great picture? You know, for Bill Bryan, I, I do anything. You see, I wrestled that wolf for almost two hours for this chapel. It's either that or Photoshop, one or the other. But in any event, it makes a very important point because, you see, the cults sound good. They use the same words we do, but they pour an entirely different meaning into those words, and therefore most Christians who talk to cultists don't actually know that they're on a different wavelength altogether. Now, what I want to do is just read a a statement. It's a doctrinal statement. It goes like this. Jesus Christ is God. He was crucified, and he shed his blood, and then resurrected from the dead. Scripture speaks of his second coming. All right, that statement's not going to win any literary prizes, but it's accurate. But you need to understand that Jehovah's Witnesses can read that statement and agree with it wholeheartedly. A Jehovah's Witness would say, yes, Jesus Christ is God, but he's not God Almighty. He is a lesser God than God the Father. There's two gods in Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes, he was crucified, but not on a cross. He was crucified on a stake. And he did shed his blood, but that didn't accomplish your salvation. You know, you still got to go door to door and hand out watchtower literature. And it's true that he resurrected from the dead, but not physically. He resurrected spiritually. And yes, there's a second coming, but it's not physical. In fact, it already happened back in 1914, spiritually. You see what I'm saying here? The cults can look at this statement and agree with it. And for this reason, you must always define your terms. I mean, there's even some New Agers that could read this and agree with it. I'm talking about New Agers like uh, David Spangler here in uh, America and George Trevelyan over in the UK. They hold to a particular form of the New Age movement. And here's what they would say. Yes, Jesus is the Christ. I mean, Jesus was a human upon whom the cosmic Christ came for three years And Jesus Christ is God. After all, we're all God. Pantheism is the truth. And yes, there was a crucifixion. He did shed his blood. He resurrected. And there is a second coming. But here's what that means. When Jesus was resurrected on the cross, the spiritual blood of Jesus Christ flowed into the spiritual earth. And once it flowed into the spiritual earth, it Christianized the core of the earth. And after that, there was a resurrection and ascension of Christ consciousness that came out of the earth, went around the planet, and then sprinkled down on all human beings so that they too could recognize that they are Christ. This is the true second coming, according to New Agers. Now, I know they say this. I've read their books. But you see the point that I'm making. You see, there are New Agers and Jehovah's Witnesses and other cultists who can read this statement and agree with it. Therefore, you must define your terms. A fourth key is this. Always check Scripture verses when they cite verses from memory. I don't care if it's a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or a New Ager. Uh, If they cite Scripture from memory, you've got to check it out. I was coming out of the Whole Life Expo, which is a New Age super convention in California, and uh, about 100,000 New Agers attend this thing, and and one Christian. (laughs) And see, I go there to do research. I interview people. I go to their workshops. I listen to their lectures. This is one of the ways that I research my books. Anyway, I was coming out of one session, and this guy walked up to me, and he says, Dude, I'm in psychic contact with dolphins. Now, no one's ever said that to me before. And I must tell you that I went to Dallas Seminary for seven years, and I cannot remember a single course that I took that told me what I should say Should someone come up to me and say that they're in psychic contact with dolphins? (laughs) Guys, what happened? (laughs) In any event, he goes on to say, well, who are you in contact with? And I thought a minute, and I said, well, I'm in contact with Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the creator of all dolphins. Yeah. (laughs) And he said... Awesome, dude. Awesome. And I said, well, why do you say that that's awesome? 
And he said, because Jesus taught yoga. <laughs> so I asked him, you know, I've read the Bible from the beginning to the end. I've never seen where it says Jesus taught yoga. So he said, man, it's right there in the good book. So he picks up my Bible, opens it up to Matthew 11, and he points at the verse where Jesus is talking to the disciples and says, see, it's right here. Jesus said to the disciples, take my yoke upon you. <laughs> and I said, well, that says yoke. It doesn't say, you know, yoga. <laughs> and he said, but dude, it's the same root word. <laughs> so, always check scripture references. Always check those scripture references. My goodness. You know, the conversation went straight downhill from there. It was just an amazing conversation. Uh, I've got another illustration here from uh, the Baha'is, or as they're properly called, the Baha'is. Uh, the Baha'is claim that Baha'u'llah is the other comforter in John 14. Now, you guys are beyond this. You guys, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. But, you know, you're going to become pastors of churches and missionaries and youth leaders and all of that, so you don't want to pass this stuff on to the people who are under you. And I tell you what, sometimes a Baha'i might be talking to an ignorant Christian and say that the other comforter in John 14 is actually a reference to their great prophet, Baha'u'llah, you see. And, uh, you know, if you knew your stuff, then you could immediately refute it. But an ignorant Christian would say, oh, really? I didn't know that. Always look up the scriptures. And if you do that, you see in John 14 that uh, very clearly Jesus identified the other comforter as the Holy Spirit. And not only that, Jesus said the Holy Spirit would come in not many days, not in the 1800s when Baha'u'llah was born. And not only that, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will be with you forever. Not a mere 75 years, which is how long Baha'u'llah lived. And finally, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will remind you of everything that Jesus himself taught. Not bring entirely contradictory teachings from a different prophet by the name of Baha'u'llah, you see. Again, the point is, always, always, always check those scripture verses because invariably they're taken out of context. Number five. Be aware that cultists are trained to answer common objections. Uh, you know, when you're witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, doesn't it seem like they've always got an answer for everything you say? Uh, I'm sure that you've had this encounter. They seem to have an answer for everything. And in fact, they're trained to do that. I've read all their manuals. And here's one of their manuals from the Jehovah's Witnesses, and here's a section called How You Might Respond to Potential Conversation Stoppers. Now in there, uh, if you should say... Well, the Dallas Cowboys are about to come on television. They've been trained in what to say. If you say, some Jehovah's Witnesses stopped by last week, so you don't really need to spend time here, they've been trained in what to say. If you say, we're already Christians here, they've been trained in what to say. If you say, well, you're that group that denies the Trinity, they've been trained in what to say. Folks, every Wednesday night, they study on what to say if you should say, any number of different things. Now, this flusters most Christians. I doubt it would fluster you, but most Christians get flustered when they hear this. So my advice is always this. Don't get rattled. Bring the discussion back to Scripture, which is where it belongs. Just keep on bringing it back to Scripture, and that's all that matters. Just understand that they're just giving you responses from rote memory that really don't mean anything. Bring the discussion back to Scripture, and you'll be fine. Now, this one's one of the most important points. Number six, ask strategic questions. Ask strategic questions. Friends, you cannot shove your theology down the throat of a cultist. You cannot do that to a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or a New Ager or anyone else. You simply cannot do it. There's this phenomenon known as compartmentalization. And compartmentalization is when uh, if you share a conflicting fact... They put it in this little box and file it away, never to look at it again. You know, it's an unusual phenomenon. But the fact is, is that one way to uh, do an end run around that phenomena is by asking strategic questions, because then you're forcing a cultist to think for themselves. And uh, what I like to do is suggest some questions. For example, if you're talking to some Jehovah's Witnesses who think that they're the only true witnesses, here's one question I like to ask. 
If the Jehovah's Witnesses are the only true witnesses for God, and if the Jehovah's Witnesses as an organization came into being in the late 19th century, which history proves, does this mean that God was without a witness for over 18 centuries of church history? That question always brings up some very good responses from the Jehovah's Witness. They start to think for themselves. If you're talking to a Mormon about humans becoming a god, you might ask this, how do you interpret Isaiah 43.10, where God says, before me no god was formed, nor will there be one after me? You see, that one always sparks interesting responses from the Mormon. It gets them to think for themselves. If they ask you to pray about the book, where's the Book of Mormon do you want me to pray about? The 1830 edition, the 1921 edition, or today's edition, which has over 4,000 changes from the original 1830 edition. Which one should I pray about? That always elicits some interesting responses. Now, when you cause them to think for themselves, they're coming up with their own conclusions, and that's what you want to happen. Now, some of you may wonder where you can get some questions like this. There's a lot of possible sources, a lot of good books written by Christian apologists on this. Uh, not to be self-promotional, but I do have two books, Reasoning from the Scriptures with the Jehovah's Witnesses and Reasoning from the Scriptures with Mormons. Each one of those contains over 350 questions that you can ask to lovingly nail them against the wall. <laughs> lovingly, lovingly. <laughs> and of course, the goal is to win them to Christ. But I tell you what, if you ask all those questions, they're going to be thinking an awful lot. They really are. And that's what you want to have happen. And then finally, number seven, share your testimony. Share your testimony. This is so critically important because what you want to do is to share what Jesus has done in your life. You may not be an expert in Jehovah's Witnesses. You may not be an expert in the Mormons. You may not be an expert in Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, New Agers, Moonies, the Baha'i Faith, Satanists, or all the others that I've dealt with. But you are an expert in what Jesus has done in your life. And that's what you want to share. You see, he has set you free by his truth. He is your savior, and he has saved you. He's your redeemer, and you are redeemed. He is your shepherd, and he guides you. And most important is the gospel of grace. Now, what I want to tell you is, is as you're sharing your testimony, keep in mind the cultic view of salvation. Nobody can survive the cultic view of salvation. Do you know what Mormons say? Mormons say that you must be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect, and they take that quite literally in terms of every area of your life. And what they will say is that you must be more perfect today than yesterday, more perfect tomorrow than today, and on and on day after day. They will also tell you that if you repent of a sin that's been a problem for you, you know, that one sin that always begets you, if you repent of that sin, and then later you fall into that sin again, then their God holds you responsible for every previous occurrence of the sin that you committed. And forgiveness is withdrawn for all the previous sins. I mean, I could preach the, you know, the next three hours on this alone, but the fact is, no one can survive the cultic view of salvation. And it's against that kind of a backdrop that you're going to want to share the awesome gospel of God's grace, where he washes you of sin, white as snow. He has taken what is filthy and given you what is pure. As Martin Luther put it, you know, Jesus took what was ours, our sin, and replaced it with what was his, eternal life. We've been washed clean. And if you have a pleasant countenance about you as you're sharing what Jesus has done in your life, I can promise you that they're going to walk away from that doorstep and they're going to be having this image in their mind of a person who is happy, who is full of liberty, who is free of guilt. They're suffering tremendous guilt. And a person who knows that he or she is going to heaven, all because of the gospel of God's grace. I wish I had a lot more time to talk about the gospel of God's grace, but you're learning that here. But share it with cultists. It will make all the difference. Now, friends, I like to make resolutions. I'm going to close with this. Every year that comes, I make a new resolution to God. And I say, God, this year, I want to be part of the solution. I want you to use me, and I want you to open up some doors. And God always does. 
And one of the things I want to do today is to challenge you to do likewise. It doesn't matter whether you're going to become a pastor or a youth leader or a missionary or a teacher in a Christian college or a seminary. Every person can participate in the process. My friends, I wish I could spend some time talking to you about how most Christians view cultists as second-class citizens. They really do. But these are precious souls for whom Christ died. They are precious souls for whom Christ died. So will you too resolve to be a part of the solution? I hope that you do. Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful for the Word of God, which is our barometer of truth, against which we can test all other truth claims. I also thank you, Lord, that your truth sets people free. I worship you for the tremendous fruit that we've seen in the kingdom of the cults with people coming out of the kingdom of darkness. My Father, I pray that you would put a holy fire within some of the listeners here today, that they too would become a part of the solution. I pray that you would make each of us into salt shakers and light bearers and give each one of us a measure of holy boldness to speak the truth in love. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.